Hi. Um, so as you can see, I'm editing the episode that you're about to see. Uh, and this isn't me trying to be meta at all. It's just to warn you that unfortunately there's a sound issue. Um, for whatever reason, uh, I don't have the sound off the recorder. Maybe I forgot to press record on the recorder like some idiot. Maybe uh, I lost the file somewhere. Maybe some gremlins came in and, and stole uh, my audio files because they're trying to ruin me. They're fans of Chris Duckman or something. But all this to say that I had to use the sound that was uh, straight out of camera, so it sounds like absolute garbage. Um, it sounds like an ISIS recruitment video, and if I'm being honest, they probably have better audio quality than I do, so uh, I just wanted to say I'm sorry, and uh, yeah, sorry, the audio is terrible, uh, next time I'll do better. Bacurau is a Brazilian film and it is directed by Clemer Mendoza Filho and Juliano Donelish. Bacurau is set in the not too distant future in a very arid Brazilian countryside that is more reminiscent of the outback in Mad Max than it is the lush Amazonian rainforest that maybe we as foreigners uh, could have expected. As a matter of fact, much like the first Mad Max, it's not so much set in a post-apocalyptic setting, but rather it seems as if we are on the verge of the fall of civilization. The Brazil depicted in Bacurau is a fascist surveillance state, a corrupt and violent society. Venturing outside the village is extremely perilous, however, it's something that its inhabitants must do in order to ensure a regular arrival of water. We open the film within the water truck that is driving furiously down the Brazilian countryside, and we immediately get a sense of the palpable tension and the danger that is lurking in the background. Once the truck pulls into Bacurau, we get a greater understanding for the dynamics within the community, a community that is self-sufficient and that represents a haven from the outside world. However, that haven is under threat as mercenaries are preparing an attack and surveilling the village by using drones that look more like Ed Wood flying saucers than they do military aircraft. I would say there are two very clear recurring themes that are present in Cleber Mendoza Filho's three films, Neighboring Sounds, Aquarius, and now this. The first one is community, and in Bacurau, when the film is about community and the dynamics of the village, that's when it's at its absolute best. The second one is about resistance, particularly as it comes to regular citizens against private corporations. In Neighboring Sounds, it was against a private security firm. In Aquarius, it was a real estate company that wanted to knock down uh, the main character's building, uh, which was an old seaside building in which he had grown up, uh, in order to replace it with a high-rise. And in this, it's evil American mercenaries, whose goal is actually pretty unclear. Now, I'm not sure if it's unclear because maybe I missed something, or if the film isn't communicating something particularly well, or if that motive is made deliberately unclear, or even if it's a combination of all three. What we do get is that the bad guys are bad because they're Americans, obviously, and they're evil, and they love to kill, and they love killing. They appear to be more on a safari hunt than on an actual mission. Now, and I'm going to start to spoil the film from now on, so please be warned, it does appear in the ending that they were hired by the local politician to eliminate this sort of pesky band of rebels that are living within this village, but we still don't get a clear motive or a reason as to why he would want to do that, and in my opinion, that is to the detriment of the film's political message. Nobody in the real world, or at least very little people, take pleasure in the death and suffering of others. It's certainly not like in this film where two mercenaries will kill a random old couple and then be so happy with it and so horny that they will start having sex in a field immediately after causing death. Evil is evil because it doesn't perceive itself as evil and it's very good about justifying itself. Yes, we're burning down the rainforest and destroying effectively the Earth's pulmonary system and jeopardizing the future of the planet, but our profit margins are way up and we're employing a whole bunch of people. I mean, you want people to be employed, right? Yes, a war will bring about some casualties, but I mean, 9-11 guys and terrorism, we can't have that happen again. 
and that helps you justify killing 600,000 to a million civilians. Yes, I want to ban homosexuality, but it's not because I hate gay people, it's because I want to protect the children, and I want to protect themselves from sin. I'm not doing it out of hate, I'm doing it out of love. And that's where true evil is. It's in its banality, as Hannah Arendt pointed out. It's in our capacity to justify and rationalize the most atrocious uh, things that humans are capable of in order to take our own responsibility away from it and detach ourselves from it. And that's not something the movie tries to grapple with at all, because it's also trying to be a sort of B-movie siege film, like a western or Attack on Precinct 13. Actually, John Carpenter is a direct reference as they use a piece of music that he wrote uh, during the film. But as an action siege movie, it's incredibly underwhelming. It's very much not in the same league as Rio Bravo or Salt on Precinct 13, and in terms of action filmmaking and directing, give me Howard Hawks or John Carpenter any day of the week. And as a political statement, it certainly is trying to tackle many things, such as corruption, American neo-colonialism, paramilitary and private military forces economic and social fractures within Brazilian society, but it mostly just throws all these ideas out and then doesn't really do anything with them. And again, while we're on the subject of John Carpenter and politics, I think something like They Live works far better as a political satire. Now that may be because of time. I do think there is something to be said about how satire doesn't necessarily always work in the era that it comes out, and when you're given 15, 20, 30 years to reflect on it, all of a sudden it becomes far more relevant. So I will grant it that. Maybe it will grow into a more interesting satire. But the catharsis at the end of They Live, when the resistance essentially starts to overthrow the government, is just amazing. Whereas with this, it becomes incredibly violent and savage to a point where it's hard for me to get on board with the heroes of the film. Especially when you consider what I'm about to say next. Now I would like to preface this by saying that I don't speak Portuguese, so if there are any native Portuguese speakers out there that can correct me or that can maybe uh, confirm what I'm saying, I would love for you guys to comment down below. But because Portuguese is a Latin language, when you see it written out, you can kind of infer what the meaning is because the words are very similar to other Latin languages like French or Italian or Spanish. And what it appears is that in the later stages of the film, there is a television screen and a news report is seemingly indicating that there is going to be a return of public executions. Now what I'm inferring from that is that in this on the brink of the end of civilization type society, there is a return even on part of the government to violence and absolute savagery. But then by the end of the movie, well, you kind of end up looking like a hypocrite when you have your quote unquote good guys exposing the decapitated heads of their victims on the town square and effectively burying someone alive, which is essentially a form of a public execution except I don't know, we're supposed to root for them because they're the good guys and they are in the right, so yay vengeance? And some people could be generous and say that that is what you get when you give people such a violent society that savagery breeds savagery and violence breeds violence. However, I'm not going to be so generous. Yes, I do sympathize with the anger of the filmmakers. I would guess that politically we're pretty much on the same side, and I pretty much agree with everything the movie has to say on a socio-economic level, but in my opinion the film that we get is a pretty poor genre film with some politically relevant messages thrown in there in order to seem legitimate, and you know, fair play, it actually worked because the film is getting tremendous amount of acclaim and uh, awards and playing major film festivals. But to me, it basically has the political intelligence of something like Rambo 4. And to be honest, it's a real disappointment. I remember loving Neighboring Sounds when it came out. It was one of the most audacious first films I had seen in a very long time. And when Aquarius rolled around, I, I liked it as well, but I felt it was a more simplified and more palatable version of the same themes. And it was fine, but it did feel a little dumbed down. Very well made, but like I said, very palatable to festival audiences, and with a very cathartic ending. And I mean, when you talk about a crowd-pleaser ending, the catharsis at the end of Aquarius was an absolute joy, and the vengeance was perfectly appropriate. 
But Baccarat was, for me, a huge step down, and I appear to be one of the only people in that camp because the film is getting rave reviews and it won the audience prize at uh, the FNC, so I may be the only one to think that this film's kind of nasty and stupid. But yeah, it was a huge letdown for me. So as always, thanks very much for watching the video. Please be sure to hit the like button if you like the review, subscribe if you're new, and until next time, see ya.